Thank you, Renee and Michaela. Uh, I'm pretty sure they'll be favoring us with more music in the future, as young as they are. Uh, we lost Frances to Washington, D.C., but uh, we got uh, her siblings helping us with the music now. Uh, reminds me of uh, when we attended Bolingbroke a few weeks ago because uh, I haven't seen Justin for the Sabbath service for several times because Justin's leading out in the worship service in Bolingbroke. Uh, the pastor started by saying, unless the Spirit moves your heart, you will not hear anything that I will say. Are you with me? And if I am not faithful to what the Lord wants me to say, you will not hear the word of God. So the pastor said, so you pray for me and you pray for you. I hope you're getting my drift. And then he goes into that one line which I cannot forget. Because if you don't pray for me and you don't pray for you so we can listen to God's word, we will just be wasting our time. So that's my request. You pray for me. You pray for you. May all of us be impacted by the word of God this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful we can continue studying the life of Paul and how you, through the gospel of Jesus, miraculously converted and changed him. As we look at the encounter he had with Jesus himself, may we, each one of us this morning, before we leave the service, have our own personal encounter with Jesus. Give us teachable minds, open hearts, and responsive hands and feet as you talk to us in Acts 9 today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there was this uh, one barber shop who catered to a lot of Christian clergy. So one uh, day, a Catholic priest uh, went into the barber shop and had his hair cut. When after the haircut, the priest was uh, ready, he pulled his wallet and ready to pay for the haircut. The barber said, no, 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 no way. I do not charge clergy. So the following day, uh, this uh, barber received a loaf of bread from the Catholic priest. And at the same moment, there was a Jewish rabbi that came in. And he had his haircut too. And then when he was about to pay, same thing happened. The barber said, no, 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 no way. I'm not accepting any payment from clergy. Following day, there was a fruit basket of pomegranates, you know, the grapes and from. And uh, at that moment, there was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who went in. <laughs> Come on, don't second guess me, okay? And then uh, he had his haircut. After his haircut, he pulled his wallet, tried attempted to pay. Barber said, no way, no way. I'm not accepting payment from clergy. The following day, there were five more Adventist pastors wanting a haircut. <laughs> okay. It's a weird way to start a sermon, but that goes to show that clergy denominational labels, religious tags are all externals. And metamorphosis or change and conversion must happen within. Without that change that the Spirit works in our hearts, all we have is external. By the way, next week will be enrollment, uh, and I'm hoping our parents in church will seriously evaluate how they send their kids to school so that they'll be educated in the fear of the Lord. Why? Because there was this young man who was enrolled in one of the elite universities in the United States from the area where you have Harvard University, you've got MIT, the best school so we have in the country. Chokar Sarneyev. 
and his brother planned to bomb New York. Uh, because of some mishaps, they ended up bombing the finish line of the Boston Marathon. And there was a big hoopla in the news because Rolling Stone magazine made, them, made him the cover. And it's amazing that the sales of Rolling Stone magazine doubled after they posted the picture of Joskar Sharneyev. According to him, we bombed those people, three dead, and over 240 were injured. A lot of them are amputees because of the bombing. It was in retaliation to what the U.S. did to Muslims in Afghanistan and Iraq. When one Muslim dies, we got to kill for Muslims. Boston Mayor Thomas Menino said, why would we want to heroize this guy? He's a terrorist. We don't want him in our neighborhoods. We don't want him on magazines. We don't want him anywhere. Probably next week, I'll give you snapshots of the investigations to those behind the 9-11 attacks in the Twin Towers in New York. But for now, how many of you have been following the case and litigation of the Fort Hood massacre? Remember Fort Hood? Nidal Hassan sprayed bullets in the fort in Texas, killing 13 and injuring 13 other military personnel. According to Nidal Hassan, I don't want any lawyers, even if you provide the public defender for me, I will represent my own self. And you know what his crusade is? I want the death penalty. You know why? Because he doesn't want to commit suicide. He wants to die in the hands of Americans because if he dies in the hands of Americans, he will be a martyr and he will go to paradise. That's a dilemma for the defense lawyers. They're pleading the judge, can we like uh, impose on our client so that he doesn't pursue that goal? Anyways, that's the mind of the terrorist. The terrorist says we are not there to commit suicide. Suicide is forbidden in Islam. Instead of committing suicide, we kill so that we can be killed and we can be martyrs. And you know what? They said for every drop of blood that we shed for Allah, we'll be assured that we'll be in paradise. Now you think terrorism is rampant today, about 2,000 years ago. Um, Saul was a terrorist of the Christian church. And let's read his bio, Philippians 3, 5 to 6. By the way, there's Bibles in your pews because there will be some verses I'd like you to look into. Uh, most of the verses will be on the screen. But please hold a Bible. There's at least a couple of Bibles in the pews. So grab one, turn to Acts. We will be reading from Acts later on in the sermon. Saul was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. What's the bio of this terrorist of the Christians? He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was not just a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was a Pharisee, one of the outstanding professors of Hebraic law. But he persecuted the church in his zeal. And when it comes to law, he was blameless. When I say blameless, you cannot find any taint in his reputation when it comes to the loss of the Jews. But there was one problem. He was not okay. He thought he was okay. God knew he was not okay. So you know what God did? He led Paul and Saul into submission. And our study for today will be the qualities of this submission that Paul underwent because of God's pursuit of him. Well, the first quality of the submission, it is a pursued submission. It doesn't happen. You do not self-manufacture, self-engineer submission on your own. You cannot submit to God. We were studying this morning. You cannot repent on your own. You cannot confess on your own. God has got to give you the gift of repentance. God has got to give you the gift of submission. How does it happen? That's our study for today. God will pursue you so that he will bring you to submission to him. 
Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Um, goads. How many of you have seen somebody training a horse or training a caravan? Of course, you don't see it. You only see Facebook today. When you were still growing up, if you were in the country, the way you train an animal is you go get a very long stick, a pointed stick, so that if the animal doesn't follow you, if the caravan or the horse doesn't follow you, you go that animal so that it can go the right direction. So God was telling Paul, I have been goading you so you can go to the right direction, but you keep on fighting. You keep on fighting me. But I'm telling you, it's very difficult if you kick against the pricks or the goats. Remember when I was small, how many of you have hit your knee against the table, the edge of the table? You know, it's painful just thinking about it. You know, you know, I hit my knee against the table. You know, a little boy, you start crying because it's very, very painful. And you know what, uh, what my parents will tell you? Just to make me feel, they try to make me feel better until they say, okay, you hit the table, <laughs> you'll feel better. What happens when you hit the table? The more it will hurt. That's what God is telling Saul. I'm trying to goad you, but every time I goad you, you try to hit me. And you don't realize that every time you hit me, the more painful it will be for you. I hope it's hitting home very slowly. Because I don't know how many of you right now sitting right there listening to me are kicking against the goads of God and avoiding his direction. There were four goads, according to John Stott, that hit Paul. And we will go into them. The first goad that Paul had was God was hitting him in his mind. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, what was he doing? He was arresting the Christians, bringing them to the council. There was a problem. Paul is saying, why am I persecuting these disciples of the way? Why? Because I cannot believe what they believe in. In fact, I cannot believe their Lord. They claim that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but Jesus Christ cannot be the Messiah. According to Jewish law in Deuteronomy 21-23, curse is he who is hung on a tree. Anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God. So this Jesus was hung on a tree. He must be cursed by God. How can he be the Messiah or the Son of God if he is cursed by God? And yet he has heard while he was in seminary studying about the law of the Jews that in fact there was a Jesus of Nazareth who had beauty and authority in his teaching. Who had meekness and gentleness in his character who was very compassionate to those who were needy and had mighty works of healing, the blind, the lame, all the sick around him. And you know what bogs him too? There is a rumor circulating in Palestine that somehow this Jesus who hung on a tree and died in the hands of the Roman soldiers is now alive. Because people are going around saying, we touched him, we saw him, we listened to him. And while Paul is persecuting the Christians, God is saying, my son is alive. Paul, think again. Who are you trying to persecute? Jesus is alive. The second goad is a goad in memory. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus. You know the story? We studied it last week. The moment the persecution broke loose through Apostle Paul in Acts Eight, all the Jews started running away. And the closest that they could run to was Damascus. It was about 120 miles north of Jerusalem. And you know what Paul said? No, you cannot run, you can run, but you cannot hide. So he started pursuing them, went to the high priest, and asked for letters so that he can arrest the Christians in Damascus, hundreds of miles north of Jerusalem. So God said, Okay, you're persecuting me. Let me bring into your memory what has transpired. Okay, now, go to your Bibles. I'd like you to go to Acts 6, verse 9. And Acts 6, verse 9 talks about the synagogue of the freedman. There was a council of the Sanhedrin, and part of those who were in the Sanhedrin were from Cilicia. 
Okay, look at that place, that's Cilicia. And then if you go to Acts 22, verse 3, Saul says that he is Saul of Tarsus of Cilicia. So if there was a trial of Stephen and Stephen started speaking, was Saul in the trial? You guys following me? Yes, he was. And according to Acts 6, while Stephen was talking to the Sanhedrin, all the Jewish teachers and the Pharisees, all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, saw his face, what? As the face of an angel. So God is telling Paul, you are persecuting these Christians, the followers of the way, and yet one of those who died in our hands stood there with the face of an angel while he was talking about Jesus Christ. You know one thing else? When Stephen was dying because he was being stoned, the last words in the mouth of Stephen was, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So Paul is looking at the disciples of Jesus and the Christian and said, what's wrong with these people? They have convictions. They're willing to die for their convictions. And you know what? When you hurt them, when even, even if you kill them, what do they say? They do not retaliate. Instead, they pray for you. What kind of people are these people? Thirdly, God did not only hit Paul in his mind and in his memory, he hit Paul in his conscience. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he arrested them. What's the Christian fellowship called during the time of Paul in the Acts? What do they call it? You guys with me? They were not called Christians. They were called Christians in Antioch for the first time. But while Paul was executing persecutions among the Christians, they were known to be people of the way. And people ask, what's the way? When I was growing up, and you don't want to know the year because it's been a very long time. Campus Crusade for Christ came up with the book to reach the younger people. And the title, the, 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 uh, the name of the Bible version that they, it was a living Bible, the name of the Bible that they distributed among the young people in the universities was called The Way. Where do you think the Christian found the way, the term the way? What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, this will be a, one of my pet peeves, one of my soapbox, I always say this. A lot of people shy from praying in the name of Jesus today. I remember when Joe Stahl was still president of the Moody Bible Institute, there's a Chicago prayer breakfast. They always do Chicago prayer breakfast every year where the mayor, the councilmen, and the top businessmen in Chicago gather. And of course, Moody, the evangelical capital in the Midwest, the president's administrators will be there to attend. So when Joe Stahl attended the prayer breakfast in the Hilton, downtown Chicago, they started with a word of prayer. And there was a Muslim imam, there was a Buddhist monk, there was a priest of a liberal denomination, and there was a regular reverend among the Protestant churches. And then after all prayers were said, no name of Jesus was mentioned. Then Joe Stoll is saying, my heart was sinking, very slowly sinking. The master of ceremony student said, I am so glad about the city of Chicago. We're growing in tolerance and the acceptance of all people and of all religions. It's amazing that we can gather together, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, together, and we can pray to the same God. And Joe Stoll is saying, I was really hurting. Nobody would like to stand for Jesus anymore. And after the remarks of the MC, everybody gave the MC a standing ovation because they were in praise of religion in Chicago. And Joe Stahl said in his small book entitled The Trouble of, with Jesus, said, I could not stand. I remained seated because I wanted to stand for Jesus Christ. 
And it seemed for the longest time that I was alone. Until I looked back, three of the professors from Moody Bible Institute were seated themselves and they did not stand. There is no way for you to believe that the God of the Muslims and the Buddhists is the same God that Christians have. Because Jesus said, what did he say? I am the way. What's the next verse? No man comes to the Father except through me. What did Jesus say? Is there any other way? No, that's the reason why they killed the Christians. Because they said, there's no other way. There is no religion among the Romans, among the Jews, among the Egyptians, among all the Gentiles. But Jesus Christ's religion, which is Christianity, that's the only way. What's the lesson here? It, uh, again, is one of my soapboxes. Don't be ashamed to pray in Jesus' name. Because when you don't pray in Jesus' name, your prayer doesn't have any power. Because only through Jesus can you have the way to God. Anyways, he persecuted the way. And yet Paul is saying, look at these people. They're willing to die for Jesus. And when you kill them and when you hurt them, they do not retaliate. Instead, they pray for you. Lastly, God goaded Paul in his conscience. We'll go back to this. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but they were, when they were put to death, what did he do? I cast my vote against them. Paul did not go out killing. But what he did was he dragged Christians outside their homes, take away all their properties, and then brought them to the Sanhedrin and the committee. And when the committee decided that they will put to death these Christians, how did Paul vote? Yes, kill them. So he didn't only drag them, he was party to the murder, not only of Stephen, but the murder of a lot of the Christians. And yet while this is all happening, and Paul was feeling that he was religious, Deep within him, he said, there is something wrong, something wrong within. Because I am good externally, but within me, there is something really, really evil. And this is what C.S. Lewis said, probably occurring in the mind of Paul. For the first time, I examined myself with a seriously practical purpose. And there I found what appalled me, a zoo of lust, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a Harlem of fondled hatreds. My name was Legion. I say this again. I'm looking at you today. By the way, the house is full. If you go to the other side, although that is closed, the other house is also full because we have an extension. There is a video running there, which is really close. We have a lot of people here all dressed up and nice externally. But Paul is saying... And God is telling us, but if you become honest with yourself and look into your heart and look into who you really are, you know what you will find? You will be no different from the evaluation of C.S. Lewis of where he is. In the spirit of Paul, we are reminded of Aesop's fable. If you're fond of reading Aesop, he has... I call it his own parables. Aesop had a parable about the dog and its shadow. According to Aesop, there was a dog who found a bone. And he had the bone. He bit the bone while he was running. While the dog was running over the bridge, he saw the reflection of himself on the water. So the, the dog thought that there was another dog with a bone. And he wasn't happy with just one bone. He wanted two bones. So you know what he did? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scare the other dog. So if he runs away, I'm going to get the bone. So he barked at the dog. And the bone fell into the water. Ended up with no bone. That's, uh, that's why I love Aesop's humor. And the uh, moral of the story says Aesop is that sometimes we become so greedy and in the process of trying to accumulate more, we lose everything. That's not what get me. 
Malcolm Muggeridge, one of my favorite authors, probably one of the most eloquent English writers, said, however fast, far and fast I've run, I'd catch a glimpse of you on the horizon and then run faster and farther than ever, thinking triumphantly, now I have escaped, but no, there you were, coming after me. Malcolm Muggeridge ran away from God all his life. And he said, wherever I went to drink, through women, through vices, and everything I can think of that the world can offer, I was running away from God every time I looked back. There he was, pursuing me and chasing after me, the hound of heaven. And finally, God, God got a hold of him and brought him home. Everybody has heard this, but I'd like to share this with you again. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find the rest in thee. I wanted to put the slide here, but couldn't find it early enough. But how many of you know Deion Sanders? Especially you guys who want sports. Deion Sanders is one of the most celebrated athletes among Americans because he was the only athlete who scored a Grand Slam homer in the major baseball league and in the same week scored a touchdown. It was one year was playing football and baseball at the same time. That was how good Deion Sanders was. And he said, one of the most exciting moments in my life was when the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. And I thought all of my dreams have been fulfilled. And yet I lay there that night. I just purchased my Lamborghini and all the money I could get. And I remained as empty, if not emptier, than ever before. Only God can fill this heart of mine. Let God talk to you. Don't let me talk to you. Right now, while you're sitting there, what are your ambitions in life? Are you happy because you have a house? You got a couple of cars. You got kids who are professionals. Are you really happy? God said, until you find me, I don't care how much you earn. Because Jesus said, what does it gain a man if he what? Gains the whole world and loses his soul. Until you find God, that vacuum in your heart will never be filled. If we go to the second quality of this mission, Quality is a personal submission. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. That's Acts 9.3. While he was riding to Damascus to arrest the Christians, there was a light that shone from heaven. What time of the day was this? By the way, for your edification, if you don't have a whole lot of time for this, there are two, three passages in Acts that summarizes the biography of Paul. One is in Acts 9, the second is in Acts 22, where he was defending himself before the Jews, and in Acts 28, when he was before King Agrippa. So if you can read Acts 9, 22, and 28, you will know the entire story of Paul. And there are some details left out in Acts 9 that's found in Acts 22 and in Acts 28. According to 22 and 28 of Acts, it was midday. It was noontime. You follow? Paul is riding the horse, and all of a sudden there is a bright light that shines from heaven. If Paul was blinded by the light and it was noonday, what was brighter, the light of the sun or the light that shone on Paul? Yes, you read it in the scriptures, you read it in apocalyptic literature. His countenance was as bright as the sun during the transfiguration. That's what it said. But in this particular case, the countenance of Jesus was brighter than the noonday sun. And I don't know if you've tried this, looking at the sun. Midday, you're going to be blind. And yet this light was a lot brighter than the sun. And what did he hear? And falling to the ground, he heard the voice saying to him, what did the voice say? So, so. Why are you persecuting me? Husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, when do you repeat the name of your loved one twice? When you're really hungry. <laughs> honey, honey, I really want dinner. 
No. When do you repeat the name of your loved one twice? You only repeat the name when you are in deep emotion. That's why when Martha started complaining because Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, Jesus told Martha, Martha, Martha. When Jesus was about to do the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he looks at Jerusalem before the crucifixion. And what did Jesus say? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. In this particular case, he looks at Saul after blinding him with his brightness and his glory. And he said, Saul, Saul, in deep emotions, I want to tell you what's in my mind. There was a Gallup survey ask people what will be the top, the top questions they will ask God. These are the type, top five questions that people said they will ask God if they were given the opportunity. The first question is, will there ever be lasting world peace? Second question is, how can I be a better person? Third is, what does the future hold for my family and me? Will there be a cure for all diseases? Why is there suffering in the world? You know, it's really funny, one commentator said, if the people who ask this question only read their Bibles, they'll find the answers. But in this particular moment in the episode we're studying, it's not the question of these people that we're concerned about. Paul had two questions, probably the two most important questions you and I should ask God. What are those two questions? Who are you? Lord. And what shall I do, Lord? Remember, it doesn't start by saying, what shall I do, Lord? And then who are you? Because you cannot obey God without first knowing him. I hope you follow me. There's one of the basic failures of the Christian life. People think that by trying to be good, there'll be Christians. Jesus is saying, no, you got to know me first. The moment you know me, then I will tell you what to do. Because the moment you know me, you will do it for me and not for you. Let me illustrate this. I gave you Hale, Prince George, the new son of royalty in Buckingham Palace, named after King George. How many of you have seen the King's Speech? King's Speech is an award-winning movie about King George who had a stutter. But yet, he was able to lead England against the war against Germany. And I don't want to tell you the stories that this not about. There was one point in the therapy of King George where the therapy said, here's what we do. I'm going to record you. Of course, during that time, we don't have the CDs. We don't have these MP3s. They had what they call the phonograph. Don't look at me funny, young people <laughs> who don't even know what the cassette is. Even before the cassette, there was a phonograph. You know, that's the way you, it goes round and round. That's why there's a term, broken record. Have you heard of the broken record? It misses the, it misses the, 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 the groove. It will keep on saying, yeah, 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 you're a broken record. It doesn't jive anymore. Anyways, while he was recording, uh, the therapist told King George, you know what you do? You put your headphones on. And then recite the opening line of Shakespeare's Hamlet. What's the opening line of Shakespeare's Hamlet? What? To be or not to be? That is the question. You know, how, how much more eloquent can you be than to recite a, a Shakespearean so soliloquy, okay? So, okay, you want to you wanna really talk like a king? Then start reciting Shakespeare. On one condition, while you're reciting Shakespeare, do not listen to yourself because you stutter. Instead of listening to yourself, he played the music of Mozart. According to the record, it was the marriage of Figaro, one of the pieces of Mozart. While he was playing Mozart in the ears of King George, George was resigning to be or not to be. And you know what happened after they recorded this? He spoke it without any stutter. What am I trying to say? Is it possible that God is goading you in so many ways 
and you cannot see him and you cannot hear him and you cannot talk properly because you're so busy listening to yourself. You know, he said that if you go to a prayer meeting of a typical Adventist church, it's no different from a list in the hospital. You list all those who are sick. You list all those who have problems. That's why every once in a while I remember Martha Kendall. You know, remember Martha Kendall? It's been a while. She's not as old as the cassette. Maybe <laughs> as old as the cassette. But I remember Martha Kendall during our, during our meet, big prayer meeting. Well, everybody's saying, pray for this who is sick. Pray for this. I have a problem. I got to get this. Oh, it's so, so depressing. Martha Kendall stands up. He said, let's praise the Lord. How does uh, Pastor James Ford put it? Why don't you start quitting telling God your problems? Instead, tell your problems about God. Did you get it? That's probably why you cannot see God. And it feels so far. You're so immersed with your problems and so many concerns in life. Why don't you put on the headphones and listen to Jesus and start reciting his word? He'll probably reach you. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Look at the passage again. I don't want you to miss this. Did those, the companions of Paul, hear the voice? They did. Did they see the light? No. Is it possible to hear without seeing? I will give you a similar illustration to an illustration I had last week. Um, one of my good friends, Pastor Atiga, who passed, I think, a year ago, used to be the coordinator of Asian ministers, told of a story of this one uh, pastor driving in the Ventura Freeway in California. And, you know, if you go to California, it's amazing. you got 10, 12-lane traffic on one direction. So I said, when the first hit California, I'm mean, comparing it to Chicago. Wow, look at all the, the freeways in California. It's so wide. And yet, even if it's so wide, there's still bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. So during this one episode, this pastor was caught in the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on the Ventura Freeway. And, you know, how many of you have driven to the Eisenhower and it was literally a parking lot? When I say parking lot, you don't move at all. You just turn off the engine. So while everybody was getting antsy and they were getting really upset that they were not moving, the car behind him started honking the horn. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, my, the pastor was so incensed. Went out of the car, looked at the lady and said, Can't you see it's bumper to bumper? Why are you honking your horn? And then the lady was smiling, said, Sir, I'm just following your bumper sticker. It says, Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> That's what I say. You can hear, but you may not see. You may hear every weekend, but you may not see. You know why? Every time you say, oh, I see. What do you mean? When I say, oh, I see. Now I understand. Now I get you. In the term of the vernacular for all the Pinoys, it's a getsmo, getskuna. I see. Hindi ko pa gets. Nadidini ko, pero hindi ko magets. Ninaintindi ko na, gets na kita. Yes, I understand. See you. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Finally, that submission is not only personal in the summons, it also is personal in the surrender. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Isn't it amazing? 
And it was after three days that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but you know what God did? He put soul in blindness, so to speak, to die for three days. So that after three days, if you come back next week, you will see him come alive in Jesus Christ and become one of the most powerful preachers and writers in the New Testament. So, we end. What do we take home today from the Word of God? This is the message of God to each one of us. The story of the gospel is not you pursuing God, but God pursuing you. Let me illustrate that. Behind enemy lines. How many of you have seen this movie? Yes. The story of a pilot, the fighter pilot, who was uh, patrolling the no-fly zone over Bosnia, one of the most difficult wars we engage in, and he was hit by a land-to-air missile, split his jet, his F-16, into two, and he bailed out, and he landed into hostile territory in Bosnia. That's why he was behind enemy lines. For six days, he exercised what he learned in survival, eating bugs, drinking from the rain, covering his head with, with, uh, with, uh, with soil and mud so that he cannot be seen right there in enemy territory. There was one point during the story where all the Boston soldiers were hitting his parachute thinking that he was there to kill him. He was only several feet away in camouflage. Six days he was there before he was rescued. What did it take for them to rescue him? He knew how to survive. He finally got what was left in his radio with a battery and he signaled another F-16 that was flying in the no-fly zone. And the U.S. got a hold of the signal and they engineered one of the most fantastic rescues that has ever happened. Scott O'Grady was his name, Captain Scott O'Grady. What was deployed by the U.S. government to get him back home? I'll give you. There are choppers, two choppers, regular choppers that actually had 51 Marines, 51 special Marines in two special choppers to look for one man. Not only that, there was also Cobra choppers which can bomb you, guns and fire guns at the enemy. There was one of the jets, there were two of these deployed alongside those four choppers and another prowler, which will help you give you some radar and some information. Of course, USS Kersarts, the destroyer, was deployed, deployed so that they can launch all the jets. There are two hornets. There are two thunderbolts. About six fighter jets with four choppers and 51 marines. There was an AWACS plane too to make sure they know the position of the enemy and the position of the U.S. soldiers. I was attempting to calculate how much it would cost to deploy all of this to retrieve one person. You know how long it took to take Scott McGrady back to U.S. territory? Seven minutes. Seven minutes when they saw him Took him back. There's a search more fantastic than the search of Scott O'Grady. That was God's search for you. It's God's search for me. No fighter jets were deployed. There were no choppers. There were no marines. But wherever you are right now, God deploys several things in your life to pursue you. It can be a deep sense of shame and guilt that you have been hiding for so long. So that even if you bury your head in the pillow, that guilt still hurts you. It can be despair and emptiness. What is this all to life? Sometimes somebody dies. There can be a calamity. Fear of judgment can be there. Tragedy can strike. You can lose a job. You can be bankrupt. But those are the goats of God. 
Sometimes it is love that you give that is never returned back to you. You know, John, James Dobson, well, Focus on the Family, no, no, no longer James Dobson, Focus on the Family was interviewing one of uh, the psychologists and said, you know that uh, how much it costs to raise a kid today in America? They say by the time they reach college, you should have spent about $250,000 just for your kid. And that's one big investment. And they said, sometimes if you spend two hundred fifty grand for your kids, at the end of the story, they don't even recognize where the $250,000 came from. And sometimes you say, Lord, if I can only do it over again, oh Lord, I can't do it. Please take over. You're transforming and converting power. Please take over, Lord. Sometimes it can be an undeserved favor where you say, oh, Lord, you're so good. I thought everything was at a loss, and then God intervenes in your life. Sometimes there's a goosebump moment where you said, wow, God must be there. I don't know what God uses to goad you. But there's one thing for sure this morning. It is not you looking for God. God is pursuing you. And if you do not resist God, he will get you. Last slide. Jesus was asked one day why he came to the world. And he gave a very simple answer. The Son of Man came to seek and to save. That which was lost. I take you to the retreat of Adventist pastors in Glacier View about 30 years ago. Elder Venden was alive then and he conducted the week of prayer during this retreat of the pastors. After one whole week, Friday night was testimony time and one pastor stood unsolicited and said, Brothers and sisters, for 30 years, I bastard in this church. And for 30 years, God tried to get me. And tonight, he got me. I don't know how long you've been in church. How long you've been part of Philem. You have a lot of plans. You have a lot of ideas. You will hear about it. We will come out, the board will come out with NCD and all the strategies. But when all is said and done, what really matters is that you find out that God has pursued you and you did not resist. And you can say, I once was lost and now I'm found. That's power, it's in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank thee for your great love a murderous fanatic in the person of soul. You change with your great love. And if you can change soul through the power of the gospel, you can change each one of us. I pray for every heart this morning as they've listened to your word. There are goads in each one of our lives. May we not ignore those goads. Instead, recognize that you're pursuing after us. Teach us to stop running and allow you to find us. Because only when you find, find us can we find you and find rest unto our souls. May that be the message of our hearts as we face another week, dear Father. Remembering that you will always be there. And if you don't resist... Your presence will always be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.